Hello, I'm Mike Buchanan, the leader of the political party Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them. I'm also the conference director. I just want to say that uh, tickets will remain on sale until the 1st of January because uh, everything in this conference, including the live Q&A sessions, is going to be stored for six months. So please, please do uh, <clears throat> encourage people to buy tickets even after, after the, the, the thing's finished. Um, I'd also ask if, if, if anybody wants to pose any questions to uh, Professor Anderson through the co-hosts, please do so in the Zoom uh, window rather than the Hoover window, which is not currently being monitored for reasons I, I shall not bore you with. Um, so I'm joined today by the wonderful Sally Ann Burris of Split the Difference, my, my co-host for today. And our interviewee is the wonderful Professor Eric Anderson. Um, uh, some of you, in fact, may, maybe most of you will have seen his um, memorable uh, and slightly controversial, it has to be said, um, uh, perhaps the two are linked, presentation at uh, the, the London conference in 2018, where he presented some data, the, the thing that always, always I recall, Eric, is some data you presented on the frequency with which, or the, the proportion of young men who have kissed other men on the lips. Um, I, I shudder to this day at, at, <laughs> at, at that, but, but, but uh, we'll move on. And you also, of course, um, uh, did, did, did a very interesting presentation last year on uh, brain injury, from, uh, pr primarily from, um, from compulsory sports. And, and you'll see it's now, Eric, as, as, as a result of you. It's, there we are, number six on our list of issues, brain damage from compulsory school sports. And that's- Oh, I'm really happy to see that. Yeah, really and it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating area, actually. And uh, yeah, you really woke, you woke up a lot of people oh, love on that issue. Um, anyway, without that, that, further- that, that, that makes me, I just can't tell you how happy that makes me. Oh, good, good. Um, Eric, without further ado, I wonder if you could just say um, a few things about your background and what, and what, what brings you here today. Right. So, uh, as you know, my name is Eric, and I'm a, I'm a professor of sport, health, and social sciences. And I'm primarily a masculinity scholar, but I work at the margins of sexuality as well. And uh, I'm brought here today because many years ago, I met Mike Buchanan in a fiery exchange of emails. Oh, yes. We have since become friends, and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to deliver. Do, do, you, do you want to say a few words on that, Eric? I don't know if you're... Well, if yeah, you're... I think I said, uh, you know, I'm one of the leading uh, experts on uh, the sociology of masculinities, and uh, I'd like to present at your conference. And I'm not sure I'm allowed to, per I'm, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say what you said but, to me. Please, please, please do, Eric. I insist. It was like, uh, I don't think we want any fucking part of you or something of that nature. <laughs> that, that would be my memory, too. And, I, would, and uh, I was like, uh, yeah, OK, thanks for that nice response. Uh, I, but I didn't give up. And I wrote back and said, I don't think you've heard me properly. Uh, I think we should have a chat. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been an, an absolute delight to be uh, Mike Buchanan's friend ever since. We agree. We disagree. We always laugh. And uh, one of the things I appreciate about this conference is the absolute quality of, um, of discussions and disagreements that you can have without anything ever turning personal. And I think it's absolutely wonderful. So I always look forward to coming back to this conference. No, I, I thought you were very big, actually, in in, uh, in 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 the response you had. But but I mean, the way I looked at it was masculinities. Well, that's feminism. That, that's just an absolutely feminism riddle thing. Why in the name of God would we want somebody, somebody from that field? Yeah. You know, it, it'd, be, it'd be like having Jermaine Greer present, you know, so. But you persisted, uh, and I'm very, I'm delighted you did, Eric. Thank you. You know, just a shameful book plug here, but it's it's not to plug a book as much as it is to highlight that, you know, there is a bit of change here. Uh, this is the first ever non-feminist book on the study of masculinities within the realm of sociology. Psychology has been a bit more open to this, but sociology has been absolutely inundated with an extreme form of uh, feminism that really looks upon men in a poor light. And uh, Routledge, you know, top textbook prov provider, um, you know, accepted this book proposal, and it is now it is now out there. Uh, Mike Buchanan has gone through the fine tooth comb, so uh, you know there's a uh, there's a changing of the guard a bit. Sally, I wonder if you could start with the first question because it's it's um, it bring, brings us very nicely on uh, fr from what Eric was just talking about the so the question from Sean. Okay, Eric. So Sean has asked. Please, can Professor Anderson tell us a bit about studying under Michael Kinnell? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear a study of what? Can you please tell us a little bit about your uh, studying under Michael, is it Kimmel? Kimmel. Kimmel. Oh, okay. yeah, Michael Kimmel. How you studied under Michael Kimmel. Yeah, so I did a postdoc with Michael Kimmel uh, in masculinities. 
and that was back in 2004. Uh, and uh, yeah, and so we've agreed and we've disagreed on many things. Uh, I found Michael Kimmel uh, with me to be somebody who can pleasantly disagree with consistently over the years. Uh, of course, Michael Kimmel has also sort of fallen victim of the own sword here. Um, you know, the you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And he got he got recalled by council culture uh, and he got himself a, a nice paycheck on the way out the door. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's the relationship. Uh, you know, one should never assume in the academic world that because two people are friends or indeed because one studied under another, that it means that they agree. So my PhD advisor was Michael Mesner at the University of Southern California, and there was very little he has to say that I agree with whatsoever. So we need to be careful not to assume that people always agree with each other just because uh, they work together. So in the, just to, to add to that, what was the, the biggest disagreement or the biggest challenge? You know, because um, I, I kind of think that being critical of different practices is, is part of the learning process. So what would you say the two key areas that you can remember that kind of brought alive maybe a little bit of a contentious opinion against yeah. each other? Well, sure. Uh, one is that, well, we both, neither of us really, we both agree that hegemonic masculinity was just not a thing, that it, that just did not exist. Now, uh, Professor Kimball didn't really um, make that point publicly. But, you know, it's quite evident in his writings. He never refers to hegemonic masculinity. He never refers to Connell uh, in those capacities. One area that we did disagree on was the nature and the extent of the meaning of the change that I started to show around the year 2005, when I showed that young straight men were becoming softer, nicer, gay friendly by 2010, that they were kissing each other, et cetera. He uh, yeah, Mike, I've got new data for you on that. So maybe next oh, year. Oh, I, I, I so don't want to see it, Eric. <laughs> uh, and I've got new data on bromances too, which you might also Oh, like. joy. Um, and I think that, uh, that Kimmel was more reluctant than I to accept these findings as genuine expressions of men being endearing. Uh, but if you ask him today, he'll say he was wrong. Yeah, he admits it. He's like, yep, this change has happened. Mm -hmm. So that was, a big, that was a big source of disagreement back in the day. Okay, so to, so is, so it, I mean this kissing thing. Mike told me about that before you came on screen. So I, I know this is a thing. So from a woman's perspective, we'd look at this like obviously I'm Muslim. So in 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 Arab cultures, you often see men kissing men. Yes. Prior to this, it was an accepted thing. I mean, in some cultures, you see them holding hands as they walk down the street. It's not seen as a feministic thing. It's seen as just something this connectivity and this brotherhood there. So, so what, what do you think was the most definitive thing that made that happen, that opened that up? So I'm gonna make a, it's really a complex theory okay. that, that I studied in uh, Islamic countries, uh, Anglo-Western countries across the globe. Uh, and it's really, uh, you know, every, every research study that I or colleagues do on this just really cements the fact that this is uh, an appropriate theory. Mm -hmm. And it is this. If you live in a culture that doesn't readily believe that your friends, family, church members are gay, then you are able to kiss other men, to hold hands walking down the street. I've seen it in Muslim countries. I've seen it in China uh, in the 1990s. Um, they don't believe that somebody can be gay. So men's bodily expressions are not policed. But the minute you enter an era that I call a homo hysteric culture, which is one that knows that gay men exist, like the United States and England in the 1940s and onwards, uh, and increasingly onwards, and has has a you know poor view of them, then men avoid each other physically because they don't want to be associated with being gay. Okay. That's the second stage. So you get first one I call homo erasure, i.e. gay people are erased, they're not a thing, so therefore we don't need a police. The second state, oh my God, these people, these gay people exist, and we really don't like them, but there's no way to tell who really is gay and who's not. So whatever you do, don't signal you might be gay by holding another man's hands or doing anything endearing or soft whatsoever. Think of Britain in the 1980s, aside from pop music. Then the next state is one I call uh, inclusivity. And that is what happens when a culture becomes inclusive of gay men, like Britain today. So yeah, we know gays exist, we like them, we don't have an issue with them. So people are able, boys, men are able to partake in these bodily behaviors again, because they're, um, because nobody cares. And so what I'm researching right now, I'm researching in Turkey and in Tunisia. And what I'm showing is that older men are holding hands 
and younger men are not because they're becoming aware that homosexuality exists in their culture and they don't want to be associated with it. So it's probably going to take 40 or 50 years before, you know, the, the attitudes towards homosexuality in the, in the Muslim world improves enough. And it is improving, believe it or not, it is improving. Uh, it's going to take, you know, decades and decades before it improves enough to where boys and men will be able to be soft and endearing towards each other once again. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Um, we turn to Philip Tanza of Gender Parity UK. Um, uh, two, two interesting questions. I'll ask the longer one um, first. In your talk, you claim that most people think sex is not a clear binary. But it is, and it is easy to see when people are naked. Intersex <laughs> people are an abnormality similar to other genetic defects. That doesn't make them less human, of course. You also say that gender is on a spectrum. Uh, what you are referring to is gender expression. The shortening of gender expression to gender created the current confusion in regards to the terms sex and gender expression. Why are you trying to deconstruct the sex binary? So, Philip, I mean, you know, frankly speaking, well, you're just wrong about that. The expression of maleness runs through not only anatomy, but through the physique. So you can line up. I could take take 100 kids that I have in my classes. You can take them and you can line them up from the most macho, square jawed, bigger framed, you know, deeper voice. And you can run them all the way down the other side. Right. You can do bell curve of this if you want down the other side to more uh, felt, more felt, more feminine, thinner hips, more swoosh, more, less muscle, et cetera, higher, higher voice. So there's a continuum of uh, morphological expressions within what we call the male gender. And then of course, and yes, you are several standard deviations out on this. So there's no doubt about that. You have people who are not male or female. So we have intersex people. We have, um, you know, people with, with a, a variety of differences in terms of their chromosomes and in terms of their sexual anatomy. You can't deny that those people exist. Now, don't get me wrong. The classification of male and female works fairly well, and it works most of the time, and it works for most of the people. I'm not arguing, you know, that that it isn't a nice loose a nice loose category that basically works. But nature doesn't do hard boundaries, and there is some variance there. So scientifically, no, there is not just male and just female. Oh, and by the way, since there's silence, you can take women and you can run the other side, right? So we all know, uh, we all know lesbian women who look butcher and, you know, are more masculine and you may mistake them for men. So this idea that gender is just male and female, well, there's huge varieties of how males look and how females look. And then, of course, there's that intersection. Okay, thank you. Um, Douglas Wallace has asked another question. It's a bit of a long question, so I'm going to have to read out. Feminists have fought for a social position in, on the basis that there is no difference between men and women. So why should we have this A and B team in the first place? And if we are able to have an A and B teams, why not have it separated by race? You speak often of running, but uh, when we did white men last win, hang on, this, sorry, tongue tied. But when did white men last win running in the Olympics? So isn't the only fair thing to do remove the segregation entirely? Can, can, I, can I just say, Eric, before you start that, um, I, I think he means in things like the 100 metres um, in particular, but also some long distance uh, running. Um, but uh, the, the, the internet legend, um, Man, Woman, Myth, did a wonderful video maybe 10 years ago saying, called something like, um, we need more white men in the Olympics 100 metres final. And, you know, which, which is a, a great, am, great point. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what the question is, though. I mean, the, you know, there's no doubt that more black men from West Africa dominate and, and Americans who come from West Africa through, you know, through exogenous slavery, that they dominate in the hundred and East Africans in the middle distance. There's no, there's no question about that. There's, there's no question that, you know, the normative of what it is to be male is far superior than the normative of what it means to be female in sport in almost all sports not extreme endurance events like long, long distance swimming, but you get the idea. I, I, I'm not sure what the question is. I think, I think what he's saying, sorry, sorry Sally, uh, I don't know if you disagree. I think what he's saying is that um, gender is one characteristic, um, um, but it's only one of several. Um, yes. Why not 
why not have what why not you could equally legitimately i think he's inferring do it by race so you could have a black olympics and a white olympics and, yes, and then yes, and then yes. you would have some let's say white um olympics finals 100 meters finals winners but at the moment um you know it's it's, it's only the it's only the gender it's only by gender that, that we that, 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 that we do this division so he's saying well let's not have a and b let's just have 100 meters final and we'll see how many women get in that and uh, as you know in virtually virtually every sport or maybe every sport yeah. there will be no no women in sight so um there's an assumption there that i'm advocating for a particular sport system and i'm not um the reality is is that we have a we have a bifurcated sport system of male female uh and we have a population of people that that mostly works well for and it really does it mostly works well for almost everybody but there are extremes where it doesn't work well for uh but you know i didn't create the system i don't advocate for the system uh, i'm not a big fan of sport in the first place i may be a professor of sport but i don't have a whole lot of love for sport uh sport has a lot of social harms when it comes to transgender athletes i tell my students think about it this way you know let's let's be perfectly honest here that and this is going to make some people upset but sport are children's games sport is a children's folly right it's it's like shoots and ladders or in the uk they call it uh uh i forgot it snakes and ladders right it's you know it is a game played almost predominantly by children and at the at the the masses of sport are kids starting to join sport at seven eight nine ten uh and by the time they get to be 16 they've dropped out in tremendously in tremendous rates and then you're left with a very 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 few small select portion of the population uh, to play professional levels of sport. So when we talk about gender integrating sports, when I talk about gender integrating sports, uh, I'm talking principally about where it hits for the masses, which is pre-puberty. And one of my arguments here is, you know, we say that sports promotes teamwork, but, and we're preparing children for their future. You know, we're not preparing children to be professional footballers, we say, we're preparing them to work in, you know, to work in a, you know, whatever, industry. Well, you know, the rest of the the rest of the work world is almost exclusively gender integrated, perhaps outside of a few, you know, religious face and, you know, and so forth. But you get the idea that, you know, men and women work together. So if we believe that team sports are to produce something good called teamwork, then surely boys need to learn to work with girls and girls need to lear learn to work with boys. So my argument is gender integrating children at that age makes perfect sense, particularly since girls tend to be bigger than boys anyhow. And then post puberty, things start to change. And here we can gender integrate sport uh, within measure, right? People then jump to rugby and say, oh, well, you know, you can have a boy knocking a girl over in rugby. And they say, you know, if I had my druthers, nobody is playing rugby here. <laughs> there is no collision and there is no tackling. If the sport is that, that one person is going to physically dominate and hurt another, then it, it, the sport shouldn't exist, not for children, right? So we can gender integrate in the early teen in early teen years and then by 16 you start to specify and you start to specialize you know if you're doing sport at 16 you're not doing it to learn teamwork and cooperation and all of that you're doing it because your identity is predicated on it you're competing at it you want to be good at it you may have your eyes set on a world-class level and at that point you know male and female you know uh, male and female teams fine whatever not an issue that may be sort of a lecture but i wasn't really sure what the question was so i gave a lecture okay um, th this from Philip Tanza. Could you elaborate how are transgender women, or trans women, I suppose most people would say, in women's sport, a men's issue? How are transgender women say that? How are, read that how again, are trans, transgender women? So how are trans? In how are trans um, women in sport a men's issue? Well, Philip, you know, great question. So, uh, you know, obviously, anyone else can be doing this this lecture. So, I have 120 students in my class. They're all sport students. They're all studying various aspects of sport, and we had this discussion. And the question I gave to them was this. And what I want to do is I want to gauge what is happening. I don't hold me responsible for what's happening in the community. I want to I want to highlight to you what what youth are thinking. And I asked the question: If you have somebody who you know looks like me, sort of looks you know neo naturally male who identifies as female, no hormone replacement therapy whatsoever, no sex change operations whatsoever, and they wanna play on the woman's team, do you say yay or nay? And I made my students vote. And of the entire student body there, not a single female said no. 20% of the men said no. And I found this very interesting. 
that men who really don't give a rat's ass about women's sports, they really don't. Um, when it comes to the issue of transgender women playing in women's sports, suddenly they really care about the integrity of women's sports, something they had no interest in whatsoever, and they want to police and control what happens in women's sports. Now, the rugby, uh, International Rugby Association, and then the RFU in, in the country of England, they tried this. A bunch of, bunch of old white men made the decision that transgender women could not play rugby, and there was revolt, and the revolt came from the cisgender women playing rugby they said no we are we are not going to play a sport that's you know uh, that discriminates like that so the argument i'm bringing is like it or not this is where the culture is going where self-identification for participation in sport is all that counts that's where the official governing bodies are going and that is where the cultural sympathies are going one may not like it but i mean it is absolutely happening and it's happening at a very rapid speed in terms of social pro in terms of a social movement it's happening very quickly. Right, but but it surely means the end of women's sports. I mean, the the I mean, why in God's somebody said yesterday, how is it that the the three hundred and fourth best male tennis player in the world is not identifying as a woman and uh, not uh, knocking Serena Williams out of the court, yeah. Wimbledon and elsewhere? I mean, you know, I mean, the, the, these people are sort of probably just about making a living, and they could be making tens of millions yeah, by identifying I, as women. I, I mean, why is that not happening? I, I don't. Sorry. I don't know. I, I I guess it just must be. You know, if 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 it's not a legitimate calling, right, then the the discourse you're going to face in terms of the backlash in the media and in sponsorships must be so great. Because I've wondered that as well. Why does some why does some male just not say I'm female and play play Wimbledon and take home the prize money? I, I, and I, I think they will. I mean, we're finding it in weightlifting, aren't we? And uh, yeah. uh, one or two other things. So, uh, an American is it a runner or cyclist, I think, who looks. Who looks like he could beat yeah. the crap out of Mike Tyson, but you know, identifies as a woman. Yeah, you know, there's a, a few things at play here. Right? You know, the other thing I, I I say is, you know, how many of you have ever played with a transgender athlete? And the answer is almost always zero, right? So this really is we are talking about extremely small numbers. And now I know that the rates of people reporting to be transgender are hugely on the rise, up hundreds of percent. But you're still talking ridiculously small numbers. I just conducted the largest ever study of LGBT athletes in North America. And out of the 1,001 coming out experiences of LGBT people, we have 11 transgender. I mean, that's just poultry. I mean, we're talking really, really small numbers. So almost in all sports at all time, at all levels, this will not be an issue. But when it is an issue, oh my God, it will be an issue. And it will be, you know, it'll be all the, the media uproar. But for the most part, I think what we're doing is making making a big deal out of something that happens uh, very infrequently. One of the other arguments I like to say is there are some really big issues out there that we should be worrying about, MHRAs particularly. And, you know, the integrity of women's sports is just not, should not be higher on our list. Philip, is, um, you, you put a, uh, just a fill on to that. You said, um, so how is it a man's issue? You know, um, I think he wants some clarity um, around that. He doesn't feel you've answered the question well enough. Well, I mean, it, it, it's not a man's issue. It's, you know, it's, it's mostly a woman's issue, isn't it? I, I, don't, I don't play any sport, but I, don't, I certainly don't play in a woman's sports team. It, it, is, it is a, you know, nobody cares about transgender men playing in men's sports. Nobody cares about that. We, can only, I ask, can we I, only care about transgender women playing women's sports. Am, okay. I, am I wrong about that? Well, I mean, I've got, I, I'm very curious about what's feeding into these premises, you know, and your research and whether psychology is part of that. My first qualification is psychotherapy. So when, when we look at drivers, the individual drivers in sports, so for example, when you talked about men who, um, you know, they wanted to keep the integrity of women's sport in place. When you talk about men and women playing a sport together. Now, my understanding as a psychotherapist would be that we have different drivers to achieve. And it, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't put a child to compete with an adult and the adult come away from that feeling satisfied that they've pushed themselves, that they've achieved their target goals. So if in a man's perception, if you put a man and a woman together, a woman will assume that there's certain sports a man's going to be better with. And, you know, I, I mean, I don't play sports, but I do go to the gym and I know what pushing means on a personal level. But I would understand a man not feeling comfortable about a woman competing with a woman 
or that the woman's integrity in a sport was kept in that zone because from a select psychological point of view, we drive ourselves to push past our own boundaries. So do you incorporate any of this in your studies and your work? I do not study transgender athletes. Very okay. few people do. I collect data from researchers who, there's only one academic book on transgender athletes. I've written it. So people think that, that I study transgender athletes myself. Okay. Uh, the only, the only study I have is, is a quantitative survey of American, North American transgender athletes and their experiences in sport. But again, they were so few in numbers that I don't, there's not much to say there. Now I am involved in starting research on interviews of transgender athletes, but it's going to take, you're going to, you know, it's going to take a year before this project's off the ground. So I don't have data yet to speak from. Okay. But what I can say is I, I don't, I don't think you're right about that. I think, uh, you know, I, I race my child uh, at a local park run 2k and every week it's really close between him and I, and I have a great deal of fun. So I think when it comes to sport, what makes sport fun for people is when it's close, mm -hmm. not when somebody's blown out of the water. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if it's close, so if it means that a third team male is playing with a first team female on the same team, then they're of equal ability, then it'll be a good, close, fun competition. Mm -hmm. There's no question that if you take, I mean, it's just, just no question at all. If you take uh, a uh, professional women's uh, football team, right? I mean, and you have them compete against a good high school boys team, the good high school boys team is going to win. There's no question about that. There's, there's no argument there. Mm -hmm. And I'm not making an argument as to what sport should or shouldn't do. I think perhaps some of the viewers are placing ideas onto me. I'm just saying, this is what's coming. This is what is. Self-identification alone is the way that youth are um, looking at whether one should be able to play uh, in the sport that their body doesn't appear that they belong to. Okay, okay. Doug, uh, Douglas Wallace in the chat room says, says this. I support self-identification. That way I can say I'm a woman for all those times that being a woman gives legal or social advantage. Can I, can I just argue, Douglas, you know, and you know, there's humor in here. I think I had a discussion with Mike once and he said, I, I think he said identify as a sexy pink elephant or something of that nature. No, 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 no. I, 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 my usual line is I self-identify as a, as a, as a very, as, as a man who's very attractive to hot young women. There you go. Exactly. And yet, and yet somehow that, that, that they, they don't accept that self-identification. I don't know. It's a puzzle. Well, uh, Hey, if you want to self-identify that way, Mike, I'm all right with that. But can I, let me, let me put it another way. Um, we are willing to take fictions seriously in terms of people's affinity. So I do not believe that there's a God. There is, there is no God and there is no scientific evidence that there's a God whatsoever it does not exist. But if somebody tells me that they're Christian, well, I, would, I would just be a jerk to say, no, you're not. There is no God. Therefore, there can be no Christians. But, but it's a deeply held belief I have. Well, prove it. Prove that God exists. Well, I can't. It's faith. Well, then, sorry, I'm not going to call you Christian. Right? Look, I'm a total atheist, but you would be a total jerk to do that. So if you think that somebody isn't female... And that scientifically it's not valid. And you're like Jordan Peterson on this one. And I love Jordan Peterson for lots of things, but not on this one. So you're going to stand by your guns and say, but it's not scientifically valid. So I'm going to, I'm going to call them he instead of she. Well, you know, Jordan Peterson, I got news for you. There's no God. You're therefore you are not a Christian, Jordan Peterson. And I just think that, you know, it just as a matter of respect, if people want to identify as Muslim, Christian, Jewish, fine. If somebody says they want to be identified as they, he or she, fine is it really that big a deal is it you you look at that list of 25 things we've got there is this really the one we need to hang our hat on and be irate about because it's not quote scientifically accurate it's just like move on this is just not a big deal it, th th this, this brings me to douglas <coughs> pardon me douglas wallace's question um and in case anyone doesn't know he's presenting uh, jordan peterson did say that i watched the interview of him i i was surprised to see just how offensive he was as well but if you watch the original interview where he's talking to the students and they've come up to him and they've sort of sequestered him on campus long before he was Jordan Peterson. He did say that. And I was, I was shocked. I was like, wow. Okay. You know, I mean, I love Jordan Peterson for lots of things, but you know, not for that. Go on, Mike. Sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. Um, so Douglas Wallace, who's speaking later in the week on the United Nations, a fascinating uh, presentation. He says uh, the United Nations has a legal definition of gender as being the same thing as sex. We wouldn't say there's nothing like a blonde or a brunette just because we recognize there are variants. 
I get that to segregate, we, we would need to draw a line. Can sex not be defined as binary with an acceptance that there are men and women? The same with gender, there's masculine and feminine. If gender is for, forever divisible, do we not get down to the individual level, making the labels entirely redundant? Well, I mean, for the most part, we, we do have just a binary and, and it works for almost everybody and almost everybody is happy with just male, female. And then you, you've got, you know, you've got to select a few people who want something different. A they, for example. So what? Yeah, I mean, it, it almost, the, the, the sex binary is under no threat of, uh, you know, of going away uh, because some people choose to identify as non-binary or they prefer the pronouns to be different. And again, we're talking a ridiculously small amount of people. Uh, yeah, so what? I mean, you're right. Yeah, we do have a sex binary. And for the most part, it works pretty well. So, Sally, do you want to move on to Sean's question? Yes, okay. So Sean has asked, how can any social change be separated in a non-sociological approach? Sorry, Sally, in, in, in a sociological approach. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, um, I haven't got my glasses on, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so in a sociological approach from the social impact of feminism. I'm sorry. Um, so I was reading the question. Someone says, don't <laughs> a matter of faith. Sex is a matter of biology. Wrong correlation. Well, of course, uh, you know, religion is a matter of faith. And so fine. So take it on their faith that they view themselves as female. Yeah. Sally, I'm sorry to butt in, but. But, but uh, there's, there's kind of a couple of questions, uh, at least what I'm seeing here from Sean. So, there okay, is. So, okay, so, so, okay, so do you want to read, read them both out? Yeah, so oh. if I read the first one, is how can any social change be separated in a sociological approach from the social impact of feminism? I'll ask you that one first. Um, uh, you know, questions about feminism are just so vague. You know, feminists come in so many different stripes. Uh, on this issue, they're hotly contested, right? You know, some feminists, say no, no, no transgender women in sport. Some feminists say yes, transgender women in sport. I, I you know, I, that's just like saying, what about religion, right? It's just too many stripes that I can't really answer it in one broad brush. If there's a specific question there that I, you know, that I can address, I will, okay. but yeah. I, I just don't even know how to make heads or sense, uh, heads or tails out of that question. Okay, so the next question from Sean is, isn't it possible, for example, that the rise of trans identification in the young is partly to do with feminism attack on men? Uh, you know, transgender issues have, transgender people have existed in cultures across the globe for, you know, I'm not gonna say time immemorial because we don't know, but, you know, the Native Americans certainly had the Bradosh, for example. So this is not exactly a new cultural phenomena. It existed long before there was a notion of feminism. So, um, I, you know, is it possible scientifically, I guess, yeah. But I think that there's pretty clear evidence that transgender people have existed uh, long before we had the idea of feminism. So uh, I would probably say no to that question. Have you explored it? Have you had a look at that? Or did... Yeah, yeah, I mean, because... Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, there, there is no, there is some view. Like I don't know whether you know this, but in two thousand and ten, the UN Women was created, and then in two thousand and eleven, the Istanbul Convention was created. And there is there is some view that um, to be able to strip the identity of a man, that these the, these parts of society where people were very individual and very small, are now being brought out into the wider form. And part of that reason is to actually kind of destable the male identity um, and and that's why it's such a global conversation you know that all of these factors are kind of knitted together at the same time um, and is there something in that again i'm a bit confused by the question are you saying that transgender is a political act and not a personal identity well, I mean, there are, there are people who are actually looking at that in different guises now. And yeah, I do wonder whether it's become what it has. I mean, part of my, my take on this, you know, part of my background is that we're now in a situation where through the generations, every single, there's a, there's a time in development between the ages of about 13 and maybe 25, 26, 27, where people are walking into the world with an identity that they're exploring, how am I going to make my mark? What am I going to achieve in this world? You know, and, and we play it out with punk and rock and piercings. And, you know, there's lots of ways that that age group plays out their identity. And there is some, in the psychological world, there is some things now going on that says 
that this generation is exploring themselves, but in perhaps a more negative format in that they're looking at it in their personal sexual identity. And when you couple some of the other stuff that's going along politically, I think I think there's there's um, there's almost a responsibility of science to have a look at it. And I just wondered whether in your you know, in your learning, your in your um, teachings, whether that's something that you're exploring. It's again, it's a muffled. Okay. I just don't know. I, I'm not really sure exactly what you're saying. Are transgender people political? Some of them are intentionally, operatively political. Absolutely. Okay. Other transgender people uh, try to go stealth. Okay. Uh, so I've got a friend who nobody knows is trans, uh, and has no mm -hmm. desire to identify as trans whatsoever has completely removed the old life uh, and it doesn't doesn't want to be political in the slightest, just wants to live their life as a man. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think transgender people come in all stripes, okay. just like everybody else comes in all stripes. Okay. Uh, I think there's a real good question out there about why are we seeing such a magnification of people identifying yeah. as trans today? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there's some some very good research out there by some very maligned people like uh, Richard Blanchard, not Richard Blanchard. Uh, um, uh, sorry. Anyhow, uh, uh, he you know he showed that 50 percent of teens who identify as trans female, if they uh, if they de you know they they will desist in time, mm -hmm. and so it makes pre it makes operating prior to puberty prior prior to puberty or hormone replacement therapy prior to puberty a bit of a gamble. Uh, so, you know, it is a complicated minefield. There's just no question about that. Okay. Uh, transgender people do desist. There's just no question about that. So it, it's a complex terrain, okay. but I wouldn't argue for the moment that people are doing it just to strike an identity, like putting on a different fashion. Okay. Um, you know, these are pretty serious issues. Um, and I, you know, I, I think it would be... That argument very much reminds me of, you know, what we said about gay people 20, 30 years ago. Well, I understand, they're, yeah. They're just, they're just trying to rebel or make their moms angry or whatever. And it's well, like... Oh. I understand and I know and I, and I hear you, but I just, for me, I think there's a responsibility in there to actually know, not assume, you know, and to do that work, that legwork, to see whether it is very magnified. And what's that's a symptom of, you know, where's yeah. what is symptomatic of something. So what is that? So Sally, yeah. I think we all do have some responsibility here. And, and, you know, look, if somebody, if somebody 30 years ago came out as gay mm -hmm. and then they said, oh, actually I'm not, or more likely they came out as straight. Mm -hmm. And then actually they were like, ah, oh, no, I'm actually not. Right. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like no harm, no foul. I'm sort mm -hmm. of a big deal. Right. Yeah. Um, but with transgender issues, if they're moving into hormone replacement therapy or surgeries, that's a big deal, right? So my position is this. If we can move our culture to accept people's self-identities at face value without requiring them to medicate or, cert or operate on their bodies, then we'll give people the ability to live these medically free lives and we will cease to pathologize their body. So in other words, if Mike Buchanan said to me today, I identify as female, I would say, absolutely fine, fantastic, don't care, I'll call you she and, you know, Mike... You know, there's no pressure to have to look the part. That, 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 yeah. that, that's a relief, Eric. Thank you for that. <laughs> I do appreciate I'd, that. I'd, I'd, I'd like to recommend um, a book by Professor Gerard Casey. I, I don't think you've read this, Eric, have you? But mm -hmm. uh, um, he makes a very convincing case. Um, he was a speaker uh, and we interviewed him on Monday that, um, y yes, you, you know, there, there, there are really no great issues most people would say today about uh, self-identifying a particular gender you know I, I don't think people are going to you know get get too strung up about that but when it comes to self-identifying sex the, the 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 problem is that um i mean gender dysphoria is a real thing but it's a yeah. rare thing i think something like one very in rare. one in five thousand or one in fifty it's, it's a very rare thing <clears throat> and and the issue then is um do we really change how we run society for 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 people who um who 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 have have this have this disorder? Okay, so let me back um, and, up. And I, I just sorry, I just like to add that that's that another book that I I, I I could recommend to people, is one called "We Are Our Brains" by by an elderly um, uh, Dutch neuroscientist who goes by the who, who, whose name is slightly unfortunate. It's uh, Dick Swab. 
which sounds like something you'd find in a clinic, doesn't it? Really, but but um, but 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 that aside, you know, he 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 um, he points to a, a great many things being the result of of um, of of you know uh, you know they happen to the brain in the womb. So, for example, he he, he talks about uh, this is one of the most fascinating ones for me. People who have um, a a feeling that a limb, you know, an arm or a leg is not theirs. And they wish to have it surgically removed. Perfectly healthy arm or leg. You know, the left leg, um, I just want to lose it. It's not mine. I don't know what it's doing there. And, and, and that happens in the womb. And he said he is, not a, he is not aware. And there are doctors who will, you know, who will amputate that leg or arm. And he says he is not personally aware of, of a single case where such an operation has happened, where the person regrets it afterwards. Uh, I've got a friend like that, and yeah, and they, and they don't regret it. And it's been years and years and years, and they're much, much happier. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But, but so, so I guess, sorry, that was a bit of a ramble, uh, Eric. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, so, but it does feed into this, Mike. And what I was going with before is if we can get people to accept self -identifica self identification of gender or sex, whatever you want to call it, right? If you could just get people to say, fine, you want to call yourself she or she, and stop this stuff about, oh, science doesn't support it. Then what we do is we make it acceptable for people to be trans without having to uh, operate or medicate. And what that does is it means that children have a greater chance of not being operated on or medicated and not to have to deal with that if they desist. So if I identify as trans as a young child and everybody says, fine, you're trans and you can look that way and be trans, you know, and you don't medicate or operate. And then you go back and say, actually, I'm cis, so, you know, I'm not trans. Uh, you know, then then this then you're back to sort of like the thing with gay people. It's like no harm, no foul. Right. But, but we're but not going to get to that point if people if people have antipathy and ear uh, and you know about saying, well, I'm not, not going to call you she because that's not scientifically accurate. We're not going to get the culture to that point, and that's uh, what we need to do to I, protect I think, children from unnecessary operations. I certainly agree with with that. I mean, the, 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 we, Sally and I were talking earlier. The what doctor could could um, perform gender reassignment surgery on a child um, but then again doctors carry out 73 million abortions every year they they they, they carry out uh, circumcisions and so on but no i'd like to go to the point eric that um um that that it's one thing respecting or you know somebody who's biologically male saying he's a woman and vice versa but the issue then is what what impacts does that have do we then allow um males basically to, I mean, in, in, the subject of your talk, you know, transgenders, transgenders in, in, in sports. I mean, do we then, the, the, the logical conclusion of that is, is the, the destruction of women's sports as we know it. Not, not that I'm gonna weep about that. Because, you know, apart, apart from beach volleyball, um, you know, I'm not interested in women's sports. Most people aren't. Um, and, and again, I, we're really not talking about the destruction of women's sports here because it is such a rare event. And by the time somebody, comes out as transgender and deals with all the psychological processes of that, the idea that they're going to be an elite Olympic level athlete, which is the, which is the level we really care about, you know, you, the numbers get knocked down even further, right? And of course, half the transgender population, we don't care about at all because women, we, trans, mm -hmm. nobody has a problem with trans men in sport. So we're only talking about half the population at a certain period of time. And they also then have to be, you know, identified as an athlete and you know so you just you just keep batting it down the numbers that are going to make it to the professional ranks are very very low now but, will it happen it absolutely will happen it, from time to but, time but, but right but the numbers need not be sizable neither i mean we, we go back to the men's player 303 in the rankings he's gonna he's gonna murder every opponent in in sight and i look forward yeah. to that yeah well it's yeah. not that i look forward to it but uh, you know, what, what are these people who think, well, either I earn nothing or I earn $10 million a year, which yeah. I mean, how it's not happened already is just I, I, I'm completely with you. I, I cannot believe this has not happened already as well. And I rightfully, you know, I, I take the stance like you tell me whatever gender you want to be known as and I'll call you that. That's perfectly fine. I just don't care. So there's a rapper and he went in and, he, you know, he lifted. He said, I, I uh, you know, I now identify as female. Right. And he lifted. He said, now I'm the world's record holder. It's like, OK, fine. There you go. You have it. Fine. I don't I don't care enough about sports. I don't I don't care who the world record holder is, whether the male or female in the 100 meter dash full stop. There's a list of 25 things on your screen there that I care about. And who wins the Olympic gold medal is just not on my list of things to really be that involved with enough to care about and to get all upset about women's sports being destroyed. And yeah.
most men uh, don't. Sally, do you want to ask the next question? Uh, perhaps one of your own that we talked about earlier. Well, I, I am very, yeah, that would be really great because I was just having a look at them actually. Um, there's one that I'm quite interested in because, um, I, and it may not be, it may not be something you know, I don't want to assume you do, but how is this conflict being played out in both the corporate world and the political world? Yeah, no, completely out of my realm of expertise. Really, I did wonder, I did think it might, yeah. You, you'll learn from me that one, one thing, I, if I don't know about something, I just have, I have no idea. I, you know, that, I don't know at all, I just don't, no idea. Okay, that's that's good then. One of the other things was, and, and it's a bit of a confirmation really, when I watched your presentation, your video, um, you literally took me on a journey. I go up, I go down, I go up, or I go down. It was like that, it was an emotional journey. And just as I thought I got what you were saying, you take me to a different zone then on that. Because one minute I'm thinking, so where's it coming from? Then I think I know where you're coming from and then you're coming from a different perspective. So it was literally all the way like this. But the, my, and I think you have confirmed it really, that the basis of what I was watching was around tolerance and acceptance. And is that pretty much where your position is on this about having tolerance and, and an acceptance of what people want? Well, I think, you know, I think you're, you hit the nail on the head there. Okay. That, you know, this, I started that talk by saying, you know, this is an issue that no one is ever going to be fully satisfied on, mm -hmm. right? But let's, well, abortion is another issue that nobody's ever going to be fully satisfied on, right? But the abortion issue has, you know, lives at stake. Mm -hmm. This just has medals at stake. Uh, and so my argument really is if we could be a bit more compassionate and look to the individuals involved and ask, our, and ask ourselves, what is the purpose of being in sport in the first place? Mm -hmm. If it is just to win medals, okay, maybe, maybe there's more of an argument to keep a certain class of people out. But if it is to develop community and friends and health and teamwork, where 99.9999% of athletes are, then, you know, this issue really is just not an issue. Let's accommodate. Let's have tolerance. Let's remember that we live in an increasingly inactive society, trying to prevent people from partaking in physical activity that they're comfortable with and the people they're comfortable around, uh, you know, it's just not something we should be engaged in. Mm -hmm. And if you just lead on from that, if there's one message apart from that that you could send to, because this is lovely, you know, this is what we all want, tolerance, acceptance, you know, understanding, that's, that's really nice. But the sports world is wrapped up in corporate identities and competitiveness in, in their product. And then the other side of that is, it's wrapped up in politics because when we look at cross boundaries geographically, there's a lot in play with who's going to get the World Cup this year or next year or the year after. Yeah. Or, you know, that so level of sport, yes, yeah, that, that level of sport is not sport, by the way, right? Mm. That's just that's just business. It's just pure corporations. It's you know, it's pure profit. It's not you know, it's not sport. Mm. It's, so how could you get your message to those environments? Though, is there a way of doing that? Oh, I mean the. That, that world is quickly turning to the self-identification of gender alone perspective because, you know, they tried all the different forms of sex testing and they all, they have all failed and they've lost lawsuits uh, in the international court of arbitration. And they're just basically being sued into like, right, there's just no way we can scientifically say who is male and who is female, and how do we police that female boundary? And without that ability to do that, and there is no scientific way to do it. We do. We haven't found one yet. And every time we think we've got one, like we thought testosterone levels would be it, you know, and we were completely wrong. Um, the human bio, the human biology is just too complex to categorize and create a cutoff line. And so, and particularly since you think, you know, elite female athletes, you know, they're freaks of nature. They're, they're the one in three and a half billion, you know, the fastest female 5,000 meter runner in the world is a freak of nature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the fact that she has more manly features is not a surprise, right? So, um, you know, being unable to scientifically draw a line that everybody agrees is fair, which has, hasn't happened and is not going to happen. The international sports community is moving towards self-identification alone. Now, that's great for many people, but as Mike and I both say, it works for now, but what is going to happen when somebody self-identifies as female for five minutes, wins Wimbledon, and then self-identifies as male for five minutes? I don't know how the corporate world's going to respond then. 
Everything. It's it, it is absolutely inevitable. I mean, oh, I, of course. But... I mean, I mean, if, yeah. I mean, even if somebody, because I think what what might drive it, Eric, is the notion that that that's only going to happen once. Yeah. Um. So so yeah. so uh, you know, either I take this five million or twenty million, whatever it is, or Chuck will do it, and I don't want Chuck to do it. I want that money. I did. So I think male competitiveness, funnily enough, will will male competitiveness will result in them identifying as women. It's, it's, a, it's a strange world we live in. Yeah, I'm surprised it hasn't happened as well. Mm. Um, and, you know, how the corporate world, how the international community of, you know, elite corporate sports will deal with that, I don't know. I know that we're, and I don't care, right? I really don't. Where my heart is, is with youth playing sport and wanting to make sport a more inclusive, tolerable, less violent, less head, less head banging kind of place and if we take head banging out of sports right then we have more ability to have uh you know mixed gender teams uh and to allow people from whatever gender identity they identify with to play in sport without it being a big deal i, I struggle to think of of an outcome of you know from let's say you know that, that the male tennis player i struggle to think of any outcome possible other than an, an end to the recognition of self-identification yeah, you know, it's going to be highly politically contested when that happens. Um, and I, I, I have absolutely no idea what will happen after that. I mean, it's very clear we're leading up to that. We're, you know, we're absolutely leading up to that. And it's, you know, of course, it absolutely will happen. What the future holds, I don't know. And, and, and as I said many, many times, you know, when I talk about sport, I'm talking about kids. I don't really care about elite sports. So I, I don't care how much money the, the guy will make from walk. You know, by the way, Mike, that individual will walk away with a with a booty, right? Yeah. They walk away with a chest full of money, but they will also walk away with a lot of stigma, a lot of social intolerance, etc. So it's it, there will be a hefty price to pay. And yet, and yet, as you say, um, you know, I think I think the Wimbledon men's final is on is 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 on. So the women's final is on a Saturday. Um, I look forward to this guy, you know, winning six. Well, he only has to play two sets. He, he doesn't have to play as much tennis, does he? Yeah. So it'll be six, six love, six love. And I'm looking forward to him um, self-identifying as, uh, as a man the next day. Yeah. And that's, and that's, that, that's an end to self-identification in sports. At the elite level. Yeah. Potentially. Potentially. At the elite Eric, level. I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there. It's been an absolutely fascinating uh, almost an hour, as, as I absolutely knew it would be. Um, uh, um, always enjoy engaging with you. Always, always, uh, always love your perspective on things, um, especially when I don't agree with them. So, yeah, so, so, on that so thank you very much. And uh, you'll hopefully join us next year. Fantastic. You know, I will, Mike. Absolutely. Great. Dolly, thank you so very much for hosting. Oh, thank you. So, you such a pleasure. And it, I hope it was, it was a was. conversation for people to uh, take, digest and enjoy. Yep. And it will be uh, the, the, the video will be loaded onto the Hoover platform within 24 hours. Um, so, yes. So thanks again. And th thanks, Sally. And thank you to to the attendees here yeah. and and especially the people who put questions yeah absolutely and it's um wouldn't be it's fun a, without questions it's it's a wrap yeah. okay. okay take care bye-bye bye bye, bye. bye.